Hi everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Dhruva. I am one of the directors of this program and I am so excited to welcome you all to the Spring Cohorts Research Symposium and Graduation Ceremony. Congratulations on all of the incredible hard work you've put in over your time in the program. Um, and I'm excited to spend today celebrating all of you. Uh, in this room and in this program more generally, uh, in the spring, we had over 200 students representing 39 different countries from across the globe, uh, doing research in 25 different disciplines, exploring incredible research questions across history, political science, economics, physics, chemistry, biology, um, and everything in between. In order to help us um, encapsulate your experience, we figured that the best way to do that would be to hear from one of you. So without further ado, I'd love to invite Joseph Young, who did a research paper on medicine and public health to share a little bit of their experience on their research journey. Joseph, over to you. Thank you. Greetings to fellow Lumineer scholars, mentors, staff, and distinguished guests. It is an honor to stand before you on behalf of the cohort. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Duvenier and his staff for allowing me to speak to you and share my thoughts. As I reflect on the past four months, I am reminded of the famous words of Nelson Mandela, who said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. At Duvenier, we have been provided with a platform for a high quality education that has equipped us with the knowledge and skills to research and tackle the challenges of the world ahead. However, this endeavor has been challenging. For each and every one of us, the past four months have been filled with sweat and hard work. The time and effort we've spent on pursuing research, pursuing our passions, regardless of what it is, have been tremendous and sometimes even daunting. Think about the countless struggles you have faced during your research process. To struggle to find a suitable research question, the struggle of analyzing and understanding the multiple complex research papers related to your topic. The struggle of coming up with your first sentence as you stared at a blank piece of paper. 
I was interested in medicine and public health, and I conducted research on the relationship between COVID-19 and stroke mortality rate with my mentor, Ms. Choi, where I struggled for weeks trying to find a suitable data set. However, despite all this, I never gave up. We never gave up. We overcame each and every obstacle put in front of us. In these four months, we have grown at tremendous rates and brought ourselves to new heights that were unreachable to us before. What we learned was not only the methodology of conducting research, but also the values of hard work, perseverance, and integrity. These values are not limited to research, but will also serve us well across the broad spectrum in life, helping us make a positive impact on the world. All of this was made possible by the impressive program at Lumineer through the countless hours that the staff at Lumineer have dedicated to the cost of supporting our endeavors. I would like to take a moment to express our gratitude and acknowledge the support and help that our mentors, the writing center coaches, the publication specialists, and the program managers have provided. It would have been impossible for us to achieve the accomplishments we have today. As we move on to the next phase of our lives, let us carry with us the lessons we learned here and continue to strive for excellence in all our endeavors. Let us never forget the values we learned and let us continue to work towards making the world a better place for all. As Mahatma Gandhi once said, be the change you wish to see in the world. Congratulations to the spring cohort of 2023 and best wishes for a bright and fulfilling future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Joseph for that speech and for just speaking on behalf of all the students who are graduating here. I think it's been amazing to see everybody grow, but also the work that you've been able to produce. Um, and to showcase this work even further, we have a couple of scholar presentations today lined up against um, seven disciplines. And I'm super excited to kick this off with our very first speaker, Holden, who will be talking um, to us a bit about compromise performance um, in traded companies. So Holden, over to you. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Holden Leader. I was a research student this past spring cohort. Um, and together with my mentor, Alan Zhang, we researched the question, under what conditions does short-termism compromise the long-term performance in publicly traded companies, which was just recently accepted for publishing in the Open Journal of Business and Management. So a background, um, short-termism, which is a focus on maximizing current benefit without due regard for its future implications, can be seen in public companies sacrificing long-term value accretive projects in order to maximize quarterly earnings and share price. Management compensation is often tied to maximizing short-term earnings or a short-term increase in share price. Therefore, they are incentivized to sacrifice long-term value-added projects in order to meet expectations. Common thinking believes that short-term short -term actions can only lead to short-term results and negatively affect long-term performance of companies. Now, you might be wondering why a section called private equity is here. So private equity is a type of firm that acquires publicly traded companies or stakes in privately held ones. Inve they invest using capital from limited partners. So these are pension funds, university endowments, high net worth individuals, and they charge these limited partners and ask asset management fee and a performance fee. The fund life is no more than 10 years and lasts usually between five to seven. Because of the relatively short life of a PE fund, PE managers are inadvertently subject to short-termism. PE firms exit the majority of their position in a company once the life of a fund is over. Therefore, PE managers are incentivized to maximize the fund's return only while they own the company, not after the company has been sp spun off. As a result, PE firms receive negative press due to this conflict of interest. My methods and analysis. So to conduct this research, I used three primary research methods. The first was a literature review. So I research, researched existing literature on the space of short-termism, specifically related to corporations and literature on private equity. Um, I also researched literature on the sociological concept of agency and structure, as it relates to short-termism. I also con conducted a case study analysis using primarily two case studies from the Harvard Business School, which you can see on the right-hand side. Um, these were uh, Restaurant Brands International version 2.0 and 
barbarians at the gate or turnaround gurus, private equity and the rise of the leverage buyout. I also used Bloomberg terminal data where I looked into the performance of Hilton Worldwide, Restaurant Brands International from the case study and Dell Technologies to compare key operating performance measures since the time of their initial public offering to present. Findings. While common thinking states that short-term actions can only benefit short-term performance, I find that this is incorrect as the short-term structural impl implementations by PE firms into their acquired companies yield positive long-term performance after they have undergone an initial public offering. So for Restaurant Brands, Brands International, they had gone from having a negative earnings per share at the time of their IPO in late 2014 to having a positive earnings per share at the end of fiscal 2022. This increase in earnings is attributed to 3G Capital, the acquiring pr private equity firm, through some of their structural impl implementations like driving efficiencies and a focus on performance goals through 3G system of management by objectives. Some of these efficiencies and increases in metrics like EBITDA or earnings before interest taxes, depreciation and amortization were directly attributed to 3G cutting, selling, general and administrative expenses by $377 million over the course of three years. And these additionally, some of these strategies allowed Burger King to expand uh, its operations into a multi-branded business or restaurant brands, internationals, subsidiary Burger King, um, and late acquisitions by management into Canadian franchise Tim Hortons and American franchise Popeyes. primary deficiency of the study. So in my paper's analysis, as you saw in the previous slide, I chose three companies in completely separate industries to compare the changes in share price, earnings per share, and EBITDA from the time of the company's IPO to present. All companies had exhibited a close to or greater than 100% change in share price. All companies had a positive change in EBITDA and all companies had uh, earnings per share increase. While my data set supported PE firms producing long-term benefits for their acquired companies, it was not a large enough data set to fully confirm this co conclusion. Therefore, in future research, I would like to see a study that focuses on creating a large data set of companies that had undergone a PE takeover to confirm or refute my conclusion. Thank you, for, thank you all for listening, and I congratulate the rest of the spring cohort for their research. Thank you so much, Holden, um, for presenting and for also showing us that this is something that you'd like to continue in the future and also made that visible to all of us. Um, thank you so much for doing it once again. Next, we have Narayani, who will be talking to us about genetic mutations. Narayani, over to you. Hi, so um, my research question is, how did genetic mutations impacting ciliary regulators result in ciliopathy? Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank my mentor, Valentina. Um, see, I prepared a script for the rest of my presentation, but this was one part where I didn't have to prepare one because I know how much my mentor has meant to me, and she has been one of the best people I've ever met, and I'm so grateful to have been her student. So with that, let's begin. All right, so for those of you who have never heard the word cilia, let's start simple. So cilia are hair-like organelles at the ends of cells that aid in a cell's ciliar ciliary movement. Now, ciliopathies are then diseases that occur from ciliary causes. So let's start with a statistic. Out of one in 33 American babies that are annually born with birth defects, one in 10,000 to 20,000 present ciliopathies. So what does this tell us? Well, ciliopathies are rare and there lies the problem. Due to the uncommonness of the disorder, due to a lack of people being affected by it, there is a lack of research and therefore a lack of treatment options. However, I'd like to present to you the basic foundation of research that lies today. So there are two types of cilia, immodal and modal cilia. As the name suggests, modal cilia are able to express movement or beat back and forth. And this is due to structural differences between both types. However, when mutations affect ciliary genes that code for the normal ciliary structure and function, this can then prevent cilia from performing its normal responsibilities. However, 
what are cilia's normal responsibilities? Now, cilia play a humongous role in many signaling pathways or processes that help our body survive. This includes the nodal signaling pathway, which is a pathway or a group of signals responsible for the left-right patterning of organs. In other words, these are the group of signals that tell our heart to go on the left, our liver to go on the right, and so on for many other organs. As you can see, cilia is very significant. All right, now this pertains to my research paper. So um, I decided to go towards a more literature review format. And this time I analyzed articles that related to my topic and crafted out things that seemed important to me. Um, some of the articles I read are listed there and um, these pertain to the genetic mutations I researched that then go to impact cilia. Um, on the right here, it shows that I used a case study mythology in parts of my research paper. And this meant I read articles that included real case studies of how these genetic mutations affected people in the real world. And for me, this was very important as it allowed me to see how these mutations were affecting people, allowed me to gather their characteristics and how lethal they can really be. And that's an article that I used a case study. All right, now this is the moment we've all been waiting for, my findings. So um, I, as you know, I decided to research the net genetic mutations of ciliary genes that then go to impact many ciliary regulators, including nucleoporins, kinases, proteins, et cetera, that then go to impact cilia. And as we know, since cilia are so significant, they then go to impact many processes in our body. One such mutation that I researched was nucleoporins. And nucleoporins are proteins that build the nucleopore complex. But what is the nucleopore complex? So in our cell, the nucleus, as you know, is the brains of the cell. And within this nucleus, there are holes known as pores. And this is where materials get transported in and out. But what acts as a barrier between having unneeded materials going out and unneeded materials from coming out? Now, this is our nucleopore complex and acts as that guard in the nucleus. And select nucleoporins, such as NUP188 and NUP93 for short, and now these are proteins, have been found to actually impact ciliary structure. So as you can see, there's a relationship between these nucleoporins and cilia. Now, normally, when modal cilia beat, because they are able to express movement, it begins the left-right patterning of organs. However, when mutations affect nucleoporins, they then affect cilia, which then affect the left-right patterning of organs. As a result, abnormal left-right patterning cases can occur. And as you can see by my diagram, this is called situs inversus. Do you notice anything wrong with this picture? Well, in situs inversus, your organs are a mirror image of each other. Now, this may not seem like a big issue. However, when organs are reversed, it can result in further complications due to certain organs taking the place of others. As you can see by my diagram at the bottom right, this shows a diagram of many genes that affect cilia, which then go to impact many organs in our bodies. This showcases the variability of ciliopathies, and there lies the problem. It's significant to note that this very tiny organelle can be responsible for impacting organisms as a whole. I'm sure many of you can't imagine how it feels to be a patient and having to go home knowing that there isn't a strict treatment option for you. And so there's the notion that if something doesn't affect you, you tend to do nothing about it. But that simply cannot apply here because there are many rare disease patients out there, not only affected by ciliopathies who are depending upon us, the youngest generation. And frankly, they're depending upon us scholars on this very zone. So it's up to us to research, find treatment options, and then all put those smiles back on those patients' faces as we research and dive deeper in this field. So I thank you for listening about a very One tiny organelle. I'm sorry, Narini, would you like to continue? Oh, sorry, I think I was muted. Yeah, so yeah, thank you so much for listening to this very tiny organelle, often shadowed, but definitely highlighted. Awesome. Thank you so much, Narini. felt like I sat in a little medical class at school with all the diagrams and the way you um, explained everything. And thank you for also reiterating that 
any small disease or anything that we think might be small to us might not actually turn out to be what it is. Um, but thank you once again for bringing this to all of us. Next, we have Ved, who is going to talk to us a little about the quant trading model that might or might not guarantee a profit. Ved, over to you. Yeah, so my, wait, first off, can you guys hear me? I just want to check. Yes, we can. Perfect. So my name is Ved Janu. I'm a rising senior, and I worked with Mr. Mike Stanley, uh, who is currently pursuing a PhD at Carnegie Mellon University, to work on a quantitative trading model that guarantees a profit. And it's essentially based on linear programming. And yeah, I'm excited to show you guys how it works. Do I have control of the slides or? All right, there we go. So first off, the model works with options. And options are a type of financial instrument which provides a trader with the right, but not the obligation, to buy or sell an underlying asset at a predetermined price, which is referred to as a strike price, within a specified time frame. Now, that is the dictionary definition that you read in any economics textbook or you find in Vestipedia. So let me explain it quickly with an example. Let's say you're a hardware store owner. And it's July right now, and the owner knows that if a blizzard hits in December, he's going to need a lot of shovels. Because last winter, when, the, when a blizzard hit, his short supply of shovels ran out, and he missed out on all the profits. So he goes to Shovels Inc., a shovels manufacturing firm, and sets up an options contract. The contract states that he has control over 100 shovels, and the contract expires in January, meaning any time between now and then, he has the right, but not the obligation, to purchase those 100 shovels at some rate per shovel, which is called the strike price. So this contract is going to cost money for the owner, because why would the shovels ink, why would the manufacturer hold these shovels for him if they could just sell them to someone else, right? So the price of that contract is called the premium. And the time to expiry is the time between now and when the contract expires. So basically how options work is they allow you to exercise control over a larger set, um, or I should say, uh, control over a large amount of assets for a relatively smaller amount. So in this paper, I propose a mathematical model. Oh, sorry, I was still on that last slide. It just took a pause, apologies. So in this paper, I propose a mathematical model that utilizes linear programming to optimize an options trading strategy to produce a profit regardless of market direction. The model takes into account the underlying securities price, the options strike price, the time to expiration, and the potential maximum profit or loss for each option contract at expiry. And it uses these factors to calculate the percentage of an investor's portfolio that should be used to take various positions in an options market. So essentially, let's say you have $100, this model will tell you, okay, out of this 100 bucks, invest $30 in this contract, invest 40 bucks in another, and based on how you split up this $100, this will give you the maximum possible profit, or if not the maximum, it will guarantee a profit. And this model provides numerous advantages over other trading strategies. First, it's scalable, it isn't dependent on time, and finally, it's simple. And I'll go more into detail about these advantages uh, later on towards the end of the presentation. Methods and analysis. So this research paper used the following. First, of course, linear programming. Linear programming are the constraint equations which form the core of the strategy. On the bottom right, in the dark blue box, those are the constraint equations which were written in Python. These constraint equations determine how much of your portfolio should be invested in which type of contract. Without these equations, we wouldn't be able to determine what we should invest in. Second, it is an options profit calculator. This is an open source calculator, which I used to calculate the maximum profit or loss for each type of contract. The data was used in the constraint equations. This options profit calculator was completely free and open source, as I just said above. So it um, was easy for me to transfer data from the calculator into my model. And finally, a working example, which I used to illustrate how the model works. In the example, I inputted data from April 21st contracts that expired on May 19th, so about a month. And it would allow us to see what would have happened if an investor used my model for those same contracts. So while today we don't have to, enough time to go deeply into exactly um, the process of, from start to finish, the model essentially told us to invest 
of our con I'm sorry, 50%, 33.3%, and 16.6% of our portfolio into buying three types of contracts. It also showed us that if we execute these trades on April 21st with $100, we would have made around $283 by expiry. So if you look to the right, you've got P1, P10, P11 is kind of disorganized at the result. But essentially, P1 stands for position one, P10 stands for position 10, P11 stands for position 11, et cetera. And positions refer to the type of contract you invest in. So for example, a um, P1 could stand for the uh, you know, $50 contract. I'm just making up an example. I don't have the exact number in my head. Rest P10 could stand for the $49 uh, contract. So these positions refer to different type of positions you can take in the market. And the model tells you how much of your money should you invest in each type of position. So based on the model, it told us that we should invest 50% into position 12, 33.3% into position 16, and 16.6% in, uh, into position 19. And if you could quickly go back to the last slide, I just wanted to um, refer this information back there. So if you guys look in the middle down here, this table is a table that has all the data about every single type of position. So if you went to, if you were able to zoom in, which we can't, sorry about that, but essentially that position 12, position 16, and position 19 would be based on this table. It tells us what each type of contract is and how it works. And uh, on the left, that's the options profit calculator. And if you see it's green and half red, the green is profit and the red is a loss. So for example, if you invested on an April 27th contract, and uh, the SPY went up to like $476. You just go up there and you would make a profit of whatever the number is. You can't really read it from up here. But yes, essentially that calculator tells us what the maximum profit or loss would be for each type of contract. So you go to the next slide real quick. Thanks. So essentially this model provides numerous advantages which aren't found in other strategies. First is scalable. This model and strategy can be used on any account size, ranging from $100 to even $100 million. A little unknown thing about the investing world is a lot of the strategies these big banks and firms use are strategies that cannot be used by any normal retail investor. If you open a Robinhood account tomorrow and you put $1,000, $10,000 in it, you wouldn't be able to execute the same strategies and make the same profits that a lot of these major funds do because those types of strategies require a much larger account size, much deeper pockets. But unlike that, this model can be used on any account size, ranging from $100 to $100 million. Second, it can be used anytime. You can use it over any time period, any time of the day, any time of the year, as long as the platform you're using, the trading platform, in this case, I used um, TD Ameritrade, but depending on the uh, platform you're using, you can use it anytime as long as the platform you're using offers options for that expiry date. This is unlike IPO trading. IPO trading stands for initial public offering trading. And in that type of strategy, you need to wait until a company says, okay, we're going to go public for you to start investing in them, for you to start speculating what's going to happen. Unlike that, you can invest in this and use this strategy any time of year. And finally, it doesn't require vast computing power. A strategy such as high frequency trading, where millions and millions of trades are executed by artificial, intel sorry, artificial intelligence within seconds every single day, that requires vast computing power, which again, requires deep pockets to invest in those sorts of resources. But unlike that, this model can be used by any Mac, any Windows, any computer you've got in your house can work with this right away. And finally, it's easy and straightforward. You input the required information and you get the suggested percentages. So this is a pretty simplified version of how the strategy works and how it can be used. But yeah, thank you for uh, listening and I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you for sharing with, I think all of us have a better idea of where we're spending our next hundred dollars and how we're spending it. But in case we don't, we also know who we can come up to for any further questions. But thank you so much, Ved, once again. Next, we have Sanvi, who's going to talk to us a bit about the post-COVID-19 economy. Sanvi, over to you. Uh, thank you. So hi everyone, my name is Sanvi Dhingra and I was a part of the Lumia Research Program in the Spring Cohort. I'd like to first express my tremendous gratitude towards all those who helped in making this program successful for me. A special thank you to my mentor, Ms. Miju Shin, who is currently pursuing a PhD in Comparative Politics at Harvard University, and my program manager, Ms. Thwani Thakur. 
So my research investigated the stigmatization that is faced by Bangladeshi international reverse migrants in the post COVID-19 economy. Now you must be wondering what reverse migration exactly is. I'm sure you must have heard of migration or reverse migration that pertains to birds, but I'm talking about the one with humans. So reverse migration is essentially in this context refers to the situation where laborers, workers, and people start migrating back to their native place in the backdrop of non-availability of livelihood and job opportunities. Bangladesh was once known for its economic success, but now it faces the challenges of reverse migration. I investigated four different areas to find out what was the main root cause that these workers faced stigmatization in both their home countries, as well as the country that they were reverse migrating from. In this case, that is India. So my first area that I investigated was COVID-19 and stigmatization. So as a result of COVID-19, the most vulnerable people such as migratory workers and their children have suffered greatly, which has created widespread global disruption. Measures of containment such as border closure and limits on travel had a substantial impact on migrants aggravating already present vulnerabilities and possibly raising transmission risks. For vulnerable groups, especially the families that rely heavily on remittances, a loss of income has led to instability, elevated risks of violence and deaths. Failing to bring back remittances, the families of these workers did not welcome, that, welcome them back into their own home. Second was the lack of protection from their employers. And this was a significant issue for the migrant workers in the nations they were employed in. Now, due to the employers' carelessness, widespread salary theft, and forced layoffs of numerous migrant employees from abroad. Despite issuing an advisory promising the internal migrants, as well as the international migrants, food and shelter, payment of their due wages and severe action against landlords who forcibly evicted them, the Indian government's warning was ineffective in protecting them. The third area I investigated was the inability to provide financial support to families. So as the virus spread, many migrant workers had their employment abruptly terminated or suspended, leaving them without a source of income. While some had salary cuts or were mandated to take leave, other employees were stood down without pay. Some people were not paid for the work they had done. Along with losing their jobs, migrant workers were frequently barred, directly or indirectly, from COVID-19 social protection programs offered to national employees, such as basic healthcare and safeguards against unexpected job and wage losses. And lastly, the ineffective public administration. The Indian government does not possess accurate data on international migrants. The National Sampe Survey 2007 to 2008 and the Census 2011, findings of which were made public in part in 2020, were the last official data. The Indian government failed to gather important information during the lockdown on international migrant deaths that took place during reverse migration. Due to the lack of an effective public administration system, the international migrants were left alone and standard, which only led to their intensified discrimination and stigmatization. So lastly, I came to the conclusion that the main reason the Bangladeshi international workers were deprived of their basic human rights was that the governments of both their home country and India neglected them throughout. So for this research paper, I went ahead with qualitative research. So the data for this research paper has been drawn from archival methods as well as recent literature. Articles that focused on how social reintegration of reverse migrations has been done in the past were carefully analyzed. And methods that are on par with Bangladesh's foreign policy were adopted while making recommendations in this research paper. Interviews conducted with Bangladeshi international workers to understand their experiences with stigmatization and discrimination were also carefully studied. Lastly, the findings. So I came up with a few policy measures or recommendations that the countries could have adopted when the time was right to help prevent stigmatization or could even do so now. So the first problem was the poor social protection coverage, which is something that both these countries need to work on. Since labor is on India's concurrent list, it is crucial that the central government establishes a standard that the others comply with. The second major problem was the faults in the distribution system of stimulus packages. Even for those who were able to get one-time financial aid, the amount was far too low to cover even the most basic needs for a month. 
and lastly the returnees and the patterns of reintegration should be carefully studied because only a few countries have the proper database to monitor the return movements of migrant workers. As I come to the end of my presentation, I'd once again like to thank everyone responsible for giving me an opportunity to be a part of this program. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sanvi. I think it's great that you've been able to really dig deep into the situation that the countries are facing, especially with migration workers, but also present us with useful suggestions that hopefully one day you would you know, be at the forefront leading um, all of these for us. So super excited to see um, that day come. Next, we have Heap Duck um, talking to us about the missing mass problem and the need for dark matter. Heap, all over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Heap Duck Nguyen, but you can call me Roger. Today in this Lumia Research Symposium for the Spring 2023 course, I would like to present my research paper called Missing Mass Problem and the Need for the Dark Matter. Uh, this study will focus on answering the research question in what ways of um, is dark matter the best theory to explain the missing mass problem and what does it consist of? For this project, my mentor is Mr. Matthew Scorkins, and I'm so grateful since he has supported me a lot during my research process. Okay, come to the next, please. Let's talk about the context for my topic. The missing mass problem is a discrepancy between luminous mass measured by observation and dynamic mass uh, calculated by classical movement. It is crucial to our understanding of the dynamics of uh, galaxy and galaxy clusters. This issue was first observed in the 1930s, uh, notably with the velocity dispersion. The standard deviation of velocities of stars and galaxies in the cluster of the coma cluster, followed by the discovery of the flat rotation curve, uh, the plot of how orbital velocity varies with the distance from its object center of Andromeda galaxy after four decades. Uh, the mass discrepancy can fundamentally explain it in the two main ways. Number one, Newton's laws of gravity do not apply to galaxy scale structures, which leads to the postulate of modified Newtonian dynamics, Mont. Uh, initially, Mont tried to explain the flat rotation curve, in which observed stellar rotation velocities were higher than calculated by Newtonian mechanics. Briefly, Milgram stated that the gravitational force was proportional to the square of centripetal acceleration rather than itself, as mentioned in the Newton second law. Number two, there are large quantities of invisible matter that boost the star to go faster, which leads to the postulate of dark matter. Dark matter is the theoretical form of matter that neither emits uh, nor absorbs light. Primary hypothetical forms of dark matter are hot dark matter, which consists of particles with masses of up to a few electron volts and ultra-relativistic velocities. Relic neutrinos are one of the candidates for the hot dark matter um, particles. Cold dark matter, which interacts very weakly with baryonic, uh, baryonic matter and electromagnetic radiation and moves slowly compared to the speed of light. Asians, weakly interacting massive particles and massive astrophysical compact halo objects are proposed particles for cold dark matter particles. Uh, please do the next slide, please. Regarding methodology, my research paper employs a literature review of evidence for the missing mass problem and two theoretical solutions from around 40 published articles, research papers, scientific journals, and other reliable resources. The information collected will support uh, the a structural assessment of how they potentially address the mentioned issue. In particular, the first two sections uh, introduce the missing mass problem, MON and dark matter. The analysis provides evidence uh, that is opposed to MON, while dark matter, especially lambda code dark matter model, successfully explains. The following discussion focuses on some limitations of this study and further research, mainly in detecting dark matter. Now I will summarize some key findings from my research paper. Number one, MON structures to explain uh, the dynamics of galaxy clusters, especially the mass distribution in the bullet cluster, two colliding clusters of galaxies. MON also offers a poor fit to cosmology, the history of the universe. Number two, uh, given the successful hot Big Bang model, uh, model 
Uh, if that model only consists of hot particles, it will create more problems for hierarchic hierarchical structure formation with the top-down sequence. This leads to a preference for the lambda code dark matter model. Despite not being detected yet, it provides the simplest explanations for the missing mass problem and other observational phenomena, from galaxy scale structure to the polarization of cosmic microwave background with a map of anisotropies. Furthermore, three independent methodologies, notably gravitational lensing, determine the clusters mass provide that dark matter outweighs viable matter by approximately five over one, like you can see in the graph on the right side of the presentation. Thank you for your, your listening. Thank you so much, Roger, for sharing. And I think it's given us all a little thought to what exactly dark matter is and what the major missing mass problem is as well. So super thankful for you to be presenting with us today. Next, we have Sri Vishnu, who's going to talk to us a little about neural networks and um, its supervision in improving the accuracy of neural networks. Sri Vishnu, over to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Sri Vishnu Vastrikala, and I'm a senior studying in Greer High International School in Bangalore. And together with my mentor, Mr. Suraj Rajendran, a PhD student studying in Cornell University, I've written a research paper that on the topic of factor is self-supervision in improving the accuracy of neural networks in the classification of melanoma images. So now a brief background on the topic. Uh, melanoma is a form of skin cancer, and like all forms of cancer, it requires a quick and early diagnosis for effective treatment. And for this diagnosis, machine learning can prove to play an important role as it provides an easier and cheaper way to detect this disease. However, forms of technology it's always important to improve the accuracy as much as possible to ensure that we don't miss any uh, possible tumors because we want to ensure that the patients have the longest uh, the greatest chance of survival so this is where self-supervision comes into play it's a form of pre-training that's done before the actual training of the model and so it has ensured to improve the accuracy a lot so how self-supervision actually works is one of the main advantages of first of all is that we don't need any pre-labeled data because the program creates its own labeled data and then the model is trained on it. So self-supervision, the entire uh, idea of self-supervision is to learn patterns from this data using the uh, pre-training and this patterns will allow it, will prepare it better for the uh, classification that's going to happen down the line. So, 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 sorry. so our supervision um, essentially uses an encoder plus decoder architecture where the encoder, the, the essence of the encoder is to break down the image into a feature vector on which calculation can be performed upon. And then the decoder uses uh, performs a calculation on the feature vector to perform whatever subtask is doing. The encoder from this is then taken on to the main task that's going to be used down the line, which will, uh, and so it will be less like preparing before the actual task is going to happen. And the pattern that I learned through the self-supervision will um, improve the accuracy of the model. This is shown in the diagram on the slide. So now my methods for the research paper, we conducted an experiment and collected primary data for this. and um, the data that was used for the training of this model was taken from a publicly available data set on Kaggle. And Kaggle is essentially a website which offers many different public data sets for machine learning model development. Uh, other main technologies that we use for this research paper were convolutional neural networks and self-supervision. Convolutional neural networks in, um, in simple words are basically a deep learning model that's specif uh, specialized for image processing. So the different supervision mod, uh, methods that we used were rotation prediction, missing patch removal, and corruption removal. Rotation prediction essentially involves taking an image, choosing a random angle between 0 and 360, and rotating the image by that angle, as you can see in the image at the bottom left. Missing patch removal involves taking a random patch from the image and blackening it out. And um, corruption removal Im involves taking two patches uh, swapping the position and repeating that same process multiple times. And over here, I want to give you an example of how this is connected to self-supervision. 
So with corruption removal as an example, we take the corrupted image as in as the input and the keep the uncorrupted image as an output. So the model will learn patterns from the corrupted images as it tries to bring back the uncorrupted images. And in the process, these patterns that it learns will be useful for the classification tasks that's going to be performed later on. So the, all the models are used in encoder plus decoder architecture as I talked about, and the encoder from the self-supervision will be passed on for the uh, classification task later on. So now the results that I got from this um, research paper, the self-supervision showed that it has a lot of potential to improve the accuracy of the model. And as you can see in the results in the table on the right, and overall, we saw that the corruption removal model performed better than the miss missing patch model, followed by the rotation prediction and then the model without self-supervision. However, there's also scope for further improvement as the self-supervised models also show more potential for further development and uh, which can help improve accuracy more further on. So that was my research paper. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank Lumia a lot for providing me with this opportunity to work on this paper. It was Really wonderful experience and I love working with them. It has been extremely helpful throughout this process. Thanks a lot for this. Thank you so much, Sri Vishnu. I think you know you've really brought up an important point of having this self-supervision model in place um, before the improvements that you've made as well, and how you can improve the overall model. Um, so thank you so much for sharing this. Next. Um, the last presentation that we have for tonight would be from Aryan, who'd be talking again to us about a little bit about COVID-19, but also more from the psychological aspect of things. So Aryan, over to you. Thanks, Nandini. Hi, everyone. My name is Aryan. Hope everyone's doing well. Uh, before I begin um, sharing some insight as to uh, what my project's about, I'd like to take a moment to thank my mentor, Jared Scruggs. Um, he's been consistently someone I could rely on to answer the many questions I've had uh, throughout this fun, exciting process. Um, his guidance was crucial and very helpful uh, in the development of my research paper. Now, the whole point of my project was for me to get a better understanding of what types of changes, uh, behavioral or psychological, uh, kids with psychosocial disabilities or diagnosis experience during the COVID-19 pandemic in comparison to others, and how parents really contributed to their children's overall experience. Uh, that being said, uh, let's dive right in. Now, previous research suggests that the COVID-19 pandemic has had a profound impact on many generations, including the younger generation of kids and uh, children. Uh, during this time, children experience psychological distress, uh, which could then lead to behavioral changes. Now, this psychological distress could have been caused by numerous factors, uh, such as a possible lack of understanding or knowledge on the reasons behind the pandemic, or from just seeing images of the virus taking its toll on its victims and placing them in fatal conditions. There were other struggles as well, such as social isolation and a lack of access to therapists or special education teachers for those with disabilities or diagnoses specifically. And this meant that many children could have and did miss out on important development skills as time progressed. Now, younger people who prefer to be outside, spend time outdoors, were not constrained to the home. And for those with disabilities, uh, this meant even more limited interaction with others. At the same time, you have a nationwide shortages of teachers who were resigning, or just the simple fact that not enough teachers were applying for jobs, and like I said, caused a nationwide shortage. However, emotion regulation strategies were there uh, and were implemented and were also found to be effective moderators of negative psychosocial changes and managers of stress. Parents of all kids uh, were able to employ these methods throughout the pandemic uh, to facilitate the tough experience for their children. Now, my study confirmed that uh, kids experience negative psychosocial changes uh, which are changes regarding the social state combined with the individual state of mind. It was important that uh, these different techniques were implemented and they really helped facilitate children's experience. Uh, just to give you a couple examples, uh, there's, a, there's an emotion regulation strategy called acceptance, uh, which encourages children to accept the current situation. Uh, there's also redirection, having children redirect their attention elsewhere and encouraging them to not overstress about the pandemic. 
and also having them adapt to the current situation by encouraging them to pursue new hobbies or interests. Later on in this presentation, I'll talk or speak a little bit more about these techniques. Next slide, please. Thank you. So for my paper, I use a questionnaire methodology. Uh, this was done using the online platform Prolific, where I distributed my survey to a total of 95 participants who happen to be parents of those with and without disabilities or diagnoses. Sample groups were divided based on whether or not uh, participants had children with or without uh, disabilities or diagnoses. Uh, some disabilities included autism, cerebral palsy, obsessive compulsive disorder, scoliosis, and dyslexia. In my survey, though, I used various skills and self-developed items within those skills. For example, one of the skills I used was a normal Likert scale, where participants would select how strongly they agreed or disagreed with some of the items presented. There were other options in between, such as somewhat agree, neutral, somewhat disagree, disagree, etc. Another scale I used was a burden scale, which was adapted from the daily uplifts and hassle scale. I would have participants rate whether they thought each item was very much a burden or not at all a burden, again, with options in between. For example, sample item here was health concerns, which basically just expressed fears of contracting the virus. However, I did make sure to include some open-ended questions that allowed parents to expand on some of the earlier items that were presented. I, I really came across some uh, inter interesting responses uh, that I really thought demonstrated the extent to how the COVID-19 pandemic disrupted daily life and really exacerbated the situation for many. For example, when asked if there were any lingering struggles from the COVID pandemic that children still encountered, a parent of uh, high functioning autism, anxiety, and depression uh, answered that their child has already been behind uh, years in regards to interacting socially, and that the COVID-19 pandemic had only extended the gap. Uh, I think that this response really supports the concept behind lots of research in the space and really supports what I said before about how social interaction is only limited more for these, for those with disabilities or diagnoses. Next slide, please. Thank you. However, my study did find some inspiring results. Uh, parental encouragement of best practice emotion regulation strategies, specifically acceptance and refocusing for those with disabilities or diagnoses, and refocusing and reappraisal for those without helped all children adjust better to the COVID-19 pandemic. We define emotion regulation techniques as acceptance, which was encouraging a child or children to learn to accept the situation. We have refocusing, encouraging children to redirect their attention to something else that distracted them from the stress caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Reappraisal, encouraging children to see the more positive elements of the challenging circumstance, that being COVID. And lastly, putting into perspective, which encouraged children to consider that the experience might not necessarily be as bad as someone else across the world, someone who could be going through a harder time. On the right-hand side of the slide, you can see two graphs that show the two emotion regulation techniques for those with disabilities and diagnoses, uh, acceptance and refocusing, in relation to the measured adjustment variable. We asked questions about how children were able to adjust to the COVID-19 pandemic, and using the scores from the various scales, we compared it to these two variables. You can see how the more these techniques were implemented, the more acceptance and uh, refocusing techniques were implemented, the more or better the adjustment level. While it is only a gradual change as seen as the uh, best fit line in the graphs, uh, it's important to consider that the COVID-19 period of time was a very long period of time. And it was a period of time in which many children had to get used to the social distancing, isolation, extend family time, and many other factors as well. However, these techniques really were effective as parental encouragement of all best practice emotion regulation strategies led to a better overall family quality of life. Basically, family life improved. Despite what, what despite what one could consider expected results, there were no significant correlations found that supported the improvement in the psychological state of children during the pandemic, even when these parent parental encouragement of best practice emotion, emotion regulation strategies were implemented. Even though my study proved that each individual technique was itself a change in the psychological and behavioral state, proving children experienced some sort of psychological and behavioral change, they were still subject to negative psychosocial changes. There really are two ends to the spectrum. One On one side, you have efforts to improve the psychological and behavioral state seen through the emotion regulation strategies, but on the other side, you have the psychological distress that many children still endure. 
with that, I just want to thank all of the Lumiere team for allowing me this opportunity to uh, present my project. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Aryan. I think it's been an absolute pleasure for us to just go through your um, research work. And it's amazing how you've dealt with such a topic that all of us have gone through. And although there were no significant correlations, I think these are a couple of strategies that all of us can definitely use in our daily life as well. So thank you so much um, for bringing in this forward. And um, just in continuation to what Aryan said, I think I'd love to just take a moment to thank everybody who's presented today and just on behalf of the entire team, I think we are super, super proud of everybody who's been able to, you know, produce a paper that they're proud of, but also just take on this um, challenge in itself. I think we've learned a lot from all of you and you've given us the uh, amazing opportunity to have worked with each and every one of you. So once again, thank you and congratulations to everybody today. Um, Dhruva, over to you. Yeah, just wanted to reiterate that these are all projects that I couldn't have imagined being able to do when I was your age. Um, at the depth that you guys have gone into and the confidence with which you're able to talk about these topics is, is truly inspiring. And I'm excited to see what each of you that presented and all of you that didn't present today um, go on to do with what you've learned and the work that you've done over the course of this program. Um, just because the program is coming to an end doesn't mean that your engagement uh, with us ends. Um, once you're a Lumiere scholar, you're a Lumiere scholar for life. Um, and so what that means is that you are automatically part of our alumni network. Keep an eye out for emails from us about sessions that we host for alumni, including with admissions officers from top universities. Um, we'll be reaching out to you uh, for sort of updates on what's going on in your life. And if you have anything to share with us, please, please feel free to reach out. We're excited to keep supporting you as you move along. Um, and you can stay in touch with each other as well. Um, uh, hopefully all of you are on our Discord community already. And if you're not, shoot an email to your program manager and we can get you on. That can be an additional place for you to stay in touch with the people that you did the program with. Um, these are some truly amazing, smart, talented humans, and, and um, you will want to stay in touch with them. So thank you all very much. Congratulations and welcome to the Lumiere alumni family.